Welcome to Love, Money, and the Law. The subject is unusual clauses in prenuptial agreements. I'm Cindy Hyde. My guest today is Robin Klein, a family law attorney in Houston, Texas. Welcome. Hi, Cindy. Thanks for having me. You bet. Okay, we've made a list of some very well, common and some not so common clauses here that do come up when we're drafting prenuptial agreements. But there's a few things in here that are particularly interesting. So before we jump there, let's just talk about what prenuptial uh, agreements could typically include. I mean, we've talked about earnings, uh, you know, keeping our property separate, but there are some situations where if we're getting married and couples want to totally separate their, their assets, mm -hmm. we need to balance the ledger in a way that uh, it's not so lopsided, especially if you don't have compatible earning capacity. Exactly. So there are a few ways to do that. One of the main reasons to have a premarital agreement usually is you've got a moneyed spouse and then you have a spouse that may be less moneyed. So the reason for the premarital agreement would be to protect the moneyed spouse's earnings and then future earnings because mm -hmm. without that um, premarital agreement, those future earnings are community property. Mm -hmm. So the money spouse would want to protect those future earnings. So in order to do that, um, the, the less money spouse is going to come in and it doesn't, you don't want it to be punitive to them. So some of the ideas that people have had with this are excuse me meaning punitive and because they're not enjoying the benefit of a community property uh, situation which of course we're talking about things that are unique to Texas right uh, it wouldn't be this way in a separate property state but for Texas if one is making a lot of money and the other person is not making nearly as much or nothing right so that's what we're referring to that's exactly what we're referring to okay. um, and that's really common and it's also common for people to have these premarital agreements that protect their separate property that's already there before marriage, which is still in, they're still entitled to upon divorce. Mm -hmm. However, earnings from separate property, such as um, stocks, that would normally be considered community property, but if you sign a premarital agreement, that would be separate property. Mm -hmm. So those are common ways of why people want to have a premarital agreement, save and accept the interesting clauses that we will be talking about today. One of the ways to do that is to have a signing bonus or an exit bonus of some kind. Yes. So talk about yes. that a little bit. Yes. So the signing bonus is really something like because the money spouse is trying to protect their future earnings mm -hmm. that the less money spouse is not going to get. For them to give up their right to those future earnings, mm -hmm. the idea of a signing bonus can come into play because that can give the non money spouse a benefit to mm -hmm. entering into the premarital agreement. And that could be cash in a lump sum. Mm -hmm. It could be a house titled in their name. Um, it could be a car titled in, me, in their name. It could be a combination of many things that are done and they're given that on the upon date of marriage mm -hmm. um, and in exchange for giving up the future earnings of the money spouse. Sort of like, said, like a nice wedding gift. Exactly. And then in consideration of these other things that you're not going to get later. Exactly. <laughs> okay. Exactly. And, and then, I'm sorry. No, we're then on, as an exit plan, mm -hmm. that's another possibility. I think it's important to note too that these are a little tricky sometimes because you don't, you have to drive something that's not an incentive to divorce either because you don't want to get married, oh, for like a month and <laughs> go, well, thank you very much. I guess this is not working out. Uh, there, there needs to be, um, uh, a very um, deliberate way of crafting exactly how you're calculating these sorts of amounts as well. Well there is a lot of sensitivity that needs to go into the preparation and construction of a premarital agreement. And you know that as well as I do that we're not trying to craft something or have communications about this future marriage that's going to be doomed in divorce. We're trying to be sensitive uh, what either our client or the other side um, 
what what their intent is and what their meaning is without mm -hmm. making the other spouse say, there's no way I'm marrying you or I'm signing this. Mm -hmm. So I think that's why the signing bonus comes in as being something that puts, not on equal ground, but it does give some assurance. It's a good that faith gesture. It's a good faith yeah. gesture, mm -hmm. exactly. Mm -hmm. Now the exit bonus would be sort of the opposite, but it is in the event of divorce, we have a very high divorce rate um, in mm -hmm. the United States, so it can be inevitable in more than half the cases. Mm -hmm. So an exit bonus would be, if this doesn't work out and we divorce, then you will get a certain sum of money, or it could mm -hmm. be a percentage of something, or you could, you can craft whatever. You can craft uh, that the parties will have some community property. You will mm -hmm. craft the an exit bonus. You can. There's various different things that you can put in premarital mm -hmm. agreements mm -hmm. that um, can be beneficial to the less money spouse in the event of divorce. Right. Okay. So let's talk about a few reasons that you know could possibly be. Um, the path to a split, and one of those is the famous adultery issue. So, fidelity clauses mm -hmm. that, that we know about uh, are are not very unusual. I don't personally like to draft them because you have an issue of proving them. First, first of all, exactly. that's the first obstacle. But uh, a lot of times, that's something that couples, you know, really want to see. So, what's your experience with working with? fidelity clauses? Um, I personally also do not like them. Um, I do believe the burden of proof can be very difficult. Um, and then you're putting parties, married couples in situations where they may have an, an inkling of something and then they've got private investigators or they're looking into cell phones. And that's then, another video about Yes, <laughs> that's a whole other yeah, area. So, you know, it, it can be common. Um, and and I want to preface too that the other clauses that this and the other clauses we may talk about, it's important to draft in, I w I'm going to call it damages. A damage, mm -hmm. uh, if the event this happens, mm -hmm. this is what the innocent spouse right. um, will receive. In other words, how much is this going to cost me if that were to happen? Exactly. <laughs> and get caught, right? Exactly. Yeah. Exactly. Well, it's a it's a good clause to think about whether or not you actually put it in a contract because it calls to question the whole subject in conversation. And my personal feeling is if you have to have one of these clauses, you know, there might be a trust issue and so that's another uh, basic element of the of, of the relationship. So, anyway, that's just a personal aside. Right. Okay, some um, moving on here, uh, we've talked about weight gain and grooming clauses. Okay, grooming is not something I'm familiar with, but weight gain, <laughs> certainly. If you gain more than whatever, how many pounds, we're done. <laughs> exactly. It's a very, um, in my opinion only, superficial clause. However, yeah. you know, when people meet, um, they may have a disparity of age between them. They may um, be very young and fit, and that's what attracted them to, to, to one another in the first place, uh -huh. and you know, that's very important to them. And so they may want to put in a clause of, you know, you will not gain over 10 pounds uh, during the course of our marriage, um, except for pregnancy, obviously. I mean, that would be impossible. I think we should do one of those, you know, places where, okay, for the next 10 years until you're 30, you don't get, and then for the next 10 <laughs> years, you get to gain another five, and then in the last quarter then, of your yes. life, you know, unless you do have a little extra weight, it, it doesn't, you know, you don't really look that good. So <laughs> postmenopausal, you need a good 50 pounds added, <laughs> break for 50 pounds. Yeah, I think we need to, um, uh, you know, put some allowances in there. Absolutely. Anyway. And it, it should be mutual. And, Hello, it is, and, I think it, and I think it would be mutual. I would hope that it would be mutual. Mm -hmm. um, and then there's also the part about grooming. And the part about grooming is the fact that, again, some people have let themselves go, let themselves go when they get married. Mm -hmm. um, it That's happens, true. and it, it happens a lot. They either gain the weight, they stop working out. Um, be comfortable. They don't, you know, groom or color their hair anymore. They don't um, shave their beard or, or they grow long 
beards and mm -hmm. you know whatever it may be um nasty scraggly stuff yeah i mean the stuff that you know if you were dating them prior to me you'd be like no i don't want that and i'm not interested in we're not that going out in the first <laughs> yeah. place right mm -hmm. so the grooming clause is basically keep yourself in the shape or appearance that you have had before right. and that's good for anybody at any stage in their marriage right. okay so but in, in this case we're writing it down okay so now the the snip clause or the tool legation yeah so there's even that possibility there is and what's interesting about that one is this is usually for people who I would think have already had their children mm -hmm. um, or there's a, a little bit of a disparity in age and things but so there's the snip clause or the tubal ligation and I have absolutely heard of this um, and it usually is something after period of time. Well, excuse me, the snip clause is referring to a vasectomy. A vasectomy, yes, right. I'm okay. sorry. And then the tubal ligation for the ladies. It's for, okay. it's for the ladies. Mm -hmm. So, usually after a period of time, could be a couple of years, maybe less, mm -hmm. that if it's a, the snip clause of vasectomy, the male or husband would get a vasectomy within mm -hmm. that period of time, um, or the woman would have tubal ligation because they don't want any more children, and that's just part of their their agreement. Mm -hmm. um, I recently know someone who did a clause like this and it was a two-year mark for the SNP mm -hmm. clause mm -hmm. and they got divorced right before the two-year mark so he's able to oh. keep it all intact. I thought you were going to tell me she had a child at the age three <laughs> 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 or, or time three in their marriage. Hmm. No. Okay. <laughs> all right. So uh, here's an interesting one about open marriages uh, yes. and the sexuality clause. And these are complicated for lots of reasons on lots of levels. But there are uh, couples who have open marriages, meaning they, they uh, share partners uh, very openly, mm -hmm. and in some cases both male and female. Yes. And uh, it's, it's a lifestyle that they both enjoy. It is. So, when we're crafting a clause like that, it brings up a lot of issues. So, uh, particularly the the high risk lifestyle. Exactly. So, what do you think? P personally, um, well, maybe not personally. No, but, just how, but I understand that that is important to people. Again, it's something that you know brought people to, these people together in the first place, and it's something mm -hmm. that they want to protect. It's important to them whether. Mm -hmm judgment-free, whatever it may be. If they're swingers, if they're into um, BDSM, which is uh, the bondage, submissive type um, mm -hmm. lifestyle, um, similar to a Fifty Shades of Grey type mm -hmm. interaction. Um, Where there is legally uh, battery and assault yes. and all sorts of other legal definitions of things that are happening. So in these cases, they're actually they're not only acquiescing, they're waiving, they're waiving. Any, any possibility of later you tort know, claims. Uh, up into, yes, exactly. I mean, of course, anything that's against public policy is not going to stand up. Um, and, and that can be many different things. But yes, they're waiving, I mean, a tort claim during marriage is, you know, if you contract an STD from your spouse and they did not tell you that they had it, that's a tort claim. So yes, in these type of situations, you're waiving that because of your preference of the way of your sexuality with your spouse. Mm -hmm. So, and you, you agree that that's what y'all are gonna do. I think uh, for many people, they don't realize that, that contracting an STD during marriage from your spouse if your spouse has not disclosed or didn't have knowledge of that, that is an actionable oh, yes. uh, uh, tort that does and can carry very high damages. Very high damages. So, that's another video discussion, but I think <laughs> it's an important uh, uh, point to mention. Okay, so incremental payment clauses. Mm -hmm. What about that? This is, I do see this actually, um, probably more than I see the fidelity clause. And it is really, again, we're protecting future earnings. Mm -hmm. Less money spouse is not gonna get what they would have normally gotten had 
they not had the premarital agreement. Mm -hmm. So the incremental payments are something where they would get a certain sum of money, and you know, it's gonna vary. I mean, people are, are gonna be in all different types of brackets, but mm -hmm. it's whatever their agreement is. So for example, if you're married, um, you know, five year, up to five years, or let's we'll say five year mark, five mm -hmm. to nine years, then you will get on that anniversary, either of five or of nine or whatever, you will get a lump sum payment. Mm -hmm. um, you can get it during marriage, uh, whatever that may be when you reach that mark. Mm -hmm. um, or, and then you can do 10 to 15 and, and so on and so forth. Mm -hmm. um, you can get do them on, upon marriage, you can make it an anniversary date of like five years, 10 years. Mm -hmm. Or in the event of divorce, if you've been married 20 years, then let's say you, you would look and okay, at 20 years, you let's say you get $20,000. It's a, it's a table. It's $20,000 out of 20 years of marriage. Are yeah. you kidding me? Well, I just See. threw out a number. So let's just say, yeah. Let's throw out that number. Let's throw out let's say $2 million. <laughs> um, that no, you would, talking that you would get that. But okay. you know, the thing is, is what happens at 19 years? So, and I literally have had a case where that was a five year to five year was one and then it continued mm -hmm. and at literally eight months shy of five years they divorce uh -huh. and there's nothing mm -hmm. now in that case he they he honored it anyways mm -hmm. but um it, yeah i mean it's it's a longevity type clause well these are contracts this is the difference these, we're talking about this is contract law when we have um uh, obligations that are you know written into the relationship and so if that's what it says that's what it says that's right. yeah. you know to each his own no judgment here okay so the other issue is privacy we touched on that earlier but uh, now with all the social media happening and many people want to document their entire lives minute by minute on the internet for whatever reason uh, this is a a great clause to have. I think I'm a big uh, proponent of this because yes. truly, I think, you know, your your personal marital circumstances, mm -hmm. your personal finances, whatever it is you've agreed to uh, privately is not something that necessarily should be shared to the with the world. And even if one person thinks it's fine and the other person doesn't, this would stop them from being able to do that. So Yes, I agree. And I think that that is a, a good clause to prohibit the other spouse or either spouse from posting their personal lives on social media. media. And then also, you know, their kids, protecting their kids mm -hmm. um, out there because it's a crazy world we live in. Um, people may be a well-known couple. And for example, I was talking about this recently you could have like a NBA star mm -hmm. and he's married and they don't post anything okay and you want to protect your kids because right. again crazy people out there can start finding out where you are and mm -hmm. you never know you put a lot of the people at risk but let's just say that they start ending up in a divorce and it's mm -hmm. not like you know we could have like a Kardashian situation mm -hmm. where then the um, hurt spouse will um, start posting terrible things or mm -hmm. private things about their relationship for all the world to see and hear. Yeah. So that would protect that. Yeah, and you would think, just as a matter of courtesy at minimum, to, out of respect to your marriage, no one would do that, but that's not the case. So this is this is a great clause to have. Right, well, we're divorce lawyers and we both know right. that <laughs> that respect goes out the window <laughs> as soon as people start considering divorce. And that's true. You see the, the worst side of everything. Mm -hmm. Okay, poison pill clause. Yeah, the poison. That's a big one. That is. That is the one basically where, I mean, because in, in most premarital agreements, I think in all of them, you really are waiving um, a right to challenge the, the prenup. You don't have to put that in there, but if you do challenge the premarital agreement, by seeking um, a de declaratory judgment or basically when divorce happens, you say it's not valid. So the poison pill clause is really, in order to not contest the validity of your agreement, mm -hmm. um, and let's tie it in with the exit bonus. So then you'll get what you're gonna get in the event of divorce. Mm -hmm. But if you do question the validity of your agreement, 
then you can say goodbye. There's a penalty. There's a penalty mm -hmm. to whatever you were going to get. Mm -hmm. And those are also fairly common. Yes, and it's another way to secure the contract in a way. I exactly. Mean, and it's also another reason why both parties need to be represented. I get that call a lot. Yes. Oh, well, can we just, you know, use one? I guess you could, but I don't think it's a good idea. You really, you have a better contract too when you have two lawyers. Exactly. Negotiating on behalf of your clients, and uh, there are lots of reasons for that. But uh, this poison pill clause is, is you know it's typically in there yeah all right we've talked a lot about different possible clauses that can go in a contract we haven't touched on enforceability because that's not the purpose of our discussion exactly. here enforceability is really up to a court to decide mm -hmm. what will stick and what won't but the general rule is you know you can put anything in these uh, contracts as long as they're not against public policy um, I think the the a couple of those that we've talked about might be a little bit um, controversial. Oh, sure. But uh, again, that's not what we're here to do. You know, the point today is to raise issues and to consider the possibilities, really. Right. And and um, more than anything, in order to negotiate your life and your lifestyle, full disclosure is really key. Yes. Uh, on, on both sides mm -hmm. and you can't just say half the story about yourself you need right. to really be uh, very candid and transparent you have any yes well to add? yes I mean generally I mean the premarital agreements are, um, and postmarital agreements they have been questionable in the past you know do they stick you know are they enforceable well they are becoming more and more enforceable because um, because more common. They, they are more common and you do have to have voluntariness and you do mm -hmm. have to have um, you know they have to be you know you have to have disclosure and the very first document that mm -hmm. actually anyone signs mm -hmm. is a waiver of disclosure and that is key if you do not have that waiver of disclosure then it can put your your agreement at risk yes, but you do have to make sure that you have full disclosure of your future spouse's assets um, their, and their financial obligations mm -hmm. because if you don't, you really don't know what you're contracting for. Mm, that's and so exactly that right. is really key right mm -hmm. there. You really need to have those mm -hmm. discussions and you need to look at some bank statements and you need to look at values mm -hmm. um, because it, that, I mean, it makes a huge difference. And if you don't know um, what's there, I mean, what, do you, what, what are you contracting for? You exactly. have no idea. Yeah, you have to know what either you're giving up mm -hmm or what you're gaining exactly or what liabilities might you might be exposed right. to or not so uh, again it's another reason to have uh, an, a family law attorney involved and emphasis on family law attorney not a business lawyer who that's not their world not a criminal defense attorney not anyone else who doesn't regularly handle these kinds of contracts because there are they are very unique they are they're absolutely okay. very unique anything else you want to add no I think that we've covered most of the interesting clauses <laughs> okay thank you Robin I appreciate you being here today oh. and thank you for joining me on love money and the law I'm Cindy Hyde thank you for joining me